Good evening and welcome to Arizona Illustrated for Wednesday the 5th of December 2012. I'm Tony Paniagua. Noticeably cooler temperatures are finally expected this coming weekend after one of the warmest falls on record. Not only that, but it has also been extra dry. Joining us to talk about this topic is Glenn Sampson. He is a meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Southern Arizona. Glenn, thanks for being here. Thank you. So it looks like we are on track to also have the hottest year on record if the temperatures in December stay a little bit warm, right? Yes. Um, the actual hottest year in record for Tucson was 1989, where the average temperature throughout the year was 71.4 degrees. If we look at what has happened in 2012, we're tied or a little bit above um, that temperature right now. So if we continue on track through December, we'll actually have the hottest year on record for Tucson. And what do you see or foresee happening this week? And apparently we're, we are going to get a little bit of a, a break from the heat. Yes, well, we're looking at uh, you know, the high pressure that's been over us, giving us these warm temperatures. We're finally seeing that shift a little bit and um, cooler air come down over us. So this weekend, we're looking at temperatures dropping close to normal, a little bit below normal, and going from 10 to 15 degrees above normal down back to normal, um, or even maybe a little bit below, will feel quite chilly to most people. What is typical for this kind of time of year? And I know, of course, we're talking about the metro area in Tucson because it can vary significantly depending on where you are in southern Arizona. Right. Our average temperature for Tucson this time of year is about 65 degrees for our high. And we've been mid-70s, close to 80s, so quite warm. We've been quite warm. So we were speaking ahead of this interview about one of the factors, apparently the, uh, the major factor that's contributing to the warmer temperatures, and that's uh, the effect called the heat island effect. If you could just explain that to our audience, please. The heat island effect is where you have an urban area, and urban areas tend to be warmer because there's heating, cooling, and there's just more activity, so it creates heat. As an urban area expands out, the surrounding area gets warmer too. So Tucson has seen a, an increase in temperatures, and that's probably the, the, the cause of the warming, or the largest warming that we've seen in Tucson is actually the expanding urban area. And of course, Phoenix has that same issue. They're much bigger, so they have a much bigger problem with it than Tucson. And that's because what uh, happens, the concrete traps the heat, and then at night, the temperatures never are, get, are able to come down significantly. Is that what Yes, occurs? the building, the concrete, the roads, sidewalks, um, those all capture heat and keep it in an area. And what about precipitation? How are we doing when it comes to the uh, amount of rainfall that we should have gotten by now this, so far this year? All of Arizona seems to be somewhat almost in a, like a perpetual drought. <laughs> This has been going on for quite a while. For this past year, Tucson, um, right now we're a little over four inches behind average. And our yearly precipitation is close to 12 inches. So when you're four inches behind, that's a significant amount. It's fairly dry. And does it look like we might be getting uh, extra rain or at least the expected amount of rain in the next few months? Unfortunately, no. Uh, even the system that's coming down this weekend where we're expecting the cold temperatures, that's really what we're going to see is cooler air. The moisture seems to be more to the east of us in New Mexico, Texas area. So we may see you know, some sprinkles here and there, but not a lot of precipitation is expected from that. And then in the, into the future, you were saying that the chances that we have about an equal chance of getting more or less rain. So what does that mean? Yes, I actually have the... Um, Seasonal forecast here. So this is the, the precipitation, uh, chances of precipitation. The green areas are, are above, above average precipitation. The browner areas are below average. You can see for Arizona, there's an EC there, and that basically means equal chances. So we're going to have equal chances of either above, below, or near average precipitation. And certainly, we've not seen much in December. Um, the last you know, heavy rains were in August. So if we continue our current trend, we'll definitely be below average for the rest of the year. All right, Glenn Sampson, National Weather Service here in Tucson. And of course, we'll provide a link on our website to your uh, company and uh, to the service so that people can get more information about this. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Water is a precious resource in the desert, and residents are well aware of this in the United States and Mexico. Tonight, we'll tell you about an agreement over Colorado River water. This segment comes to us from KAET, our sister television station in Phoenix. 
Here to explain all this is CAP General Manager David Modier. Good to have you here. Thanks for Thank joining you, us. Glad to be here. Uh, before we get started, Minute 319, what's that all about? Well, minutes are, uh, I would uh, liken it to you have a set of rules in a game or something, and now we're going to have referees administer them, how they do that. And, and that's sort of how you would look at a minute in this. It's not really part of the basic treaty that's between the United States and Mexico over water, but it defines how you're going to operate underneath that treaty. So there have been a lot of minutes over the years. Obviously, we're up to 319 now, and they all usually deal with a specific area of concern between the two countries. Let's talk about this particular agreement. It's a U.S. deal regarding Colorado River allocations, and then we help Mexico with canal repairs, something along those lines? Well, uh, it's a little bit deeper than that, but the, the basics of this were the differences between Mexico and the Colorado River Basin states over how to implement uh, items like shortage sharing during uh, shortage on the river. Was Mexico going to take it or not? The treaty calls for them to share in extraordinary droughts, but that's never been defined. This is the first time we've been able to reach a comprehensive agreement about how we would share the resources of the Colorado and how we would all share in deficits and surpluses along the Colorado. So it's a historic agreement in that context. And in, although there are 319 minutes to the treaty, this is one of the most significant. But, but again, the idea of, of moving this along or being part of this particular deal is the idea of, of helping Mexico with some, some damage repair, correct? That's right. We will provide some funding out of the United States to both help them recover from the damage they experienced in the earthquake and also to create some conservation projects that will conserve water in Mexico. And that will give us a good... Uh, basis for understanding how the United States and Mexico can cooperate in water conservation projects on both sides of the border to ensure the long-term sustainability of the flows of the Colorado. Is that pretty bad damage they had down there? They had significant damage to, to their canals in particular where subsidence created by the earthquake created water flowing in the wrong directions in the mm. canals and it's a substantial amount of money which they don't simply have the resources to affect all of the repairs. Now is this a one-time increase in water for America and Arizona? Yes, this is a one-time five-year deal which expires December 31st of 2017. It provides for specific amounts of water that will go to the three lower basin states, California, Nevada, and Arizona through the CAP in Arizona and the amount of money that will be provided by the federal government and the three states in funding these pilot projects and repairs in Mexico. Impact to Arizona, how much water are we talking about? We will get about 23,750 acre foot of water uh, from Mexican water apportionment left in Lake Mead and then we have a, uh, several decades of which we can choose how to use that water. How, when, that, when you talk about acre feet, and that, that's, uh, it sounds like a lot, but what does it mean in real terms? It's about 326,000 gallons of water each acre foot. So okay. it's enough to serve somewhere between two and three families in the Phoenix area. Okay, and that's again over On a five? On an annual basis. Okay, and, over, and again a five-year period here. Um, as far as Mexico is concerned, they get to store unused water at Lake Mead, correct? That is correct. We, we've had a previous agreement over the last couple of years which allowed Mexico to store some of their unused water which has been unused because of the results of the damage from the earthquake and we've been allowed them to use it on a temporary basis by storing it in Lake Mead. This will codify all that under a minute agreement that allows them a certain amount to store on an annual basis and then a certain amount of that that they store of the about 250,000 acre foot they can use about 200,000 on an annual basis then that water that's stored is subject to the same criteria of, of the state storing water in Lake Mead, subject to evaporation, all the other criteria that go along with that. This particular deal or agreement, is this something unusual? Have we had similar agreements in the past? Well, we have had similar agreements, but not to this magnitude. We've had agreements related to salinity in the river and how to manage that and how to do some other issues uh, about water flows to Mexico, but none of them of this significance. It not only provides water to us here in Arizona and to California and Nevada, it also provides water to the Mexicans that they will be able to have a pulse flow. They will be able to see whether flows can 
go through the system and reach all the way to the Gulf of California again for the first time in a number of years not generated by flooding conditions so I think both countries are benefiting significantly out of this arrangement provides the framework for the future where we can work together to begin to find ways to augment the Colorado River for the systemic shortages that are going to happen over the next 50 years or so. Uh, we need each other in this ball game working together. Before I get back to the agreement, you mentioned systemic shortages that are forecast. What are you seeing out there? What are you hearing as far as the future is concerned? Because it just seems like there's a whole lot of skepticism out there that we're going to have enough water. Well, I think, I think under any criteria that we have looked at, and particularly in terms of the Bureau of Reclamation's uh, basin study, which has taken a look at demands and uh, water flows in the river over the next 50 years, there is no scenario that doesn't say that we don't have a gap in the amount of water that is needed and the amount of water that will be present in the river. So there has to be some extraordinary measures taken by all of the states uh, in regards to that, and that includes conservation, it includes reuse of water, it includes augmentation, in other words, finding another source to augment the supply of the Colorado, and it's important for both Mexico and the United States to be involved in this process. And as far as this deal is concerned, how did it take shape? Major players, how long a process was this? We know 319 minutes were involved, uh, but this is very significant. This had to have taken a long time. This has been going on now for about four and a half years constant meetings uh, both on the technical side of it and on the principal side like people from the state of Arizona Department of Water Resources Director, uh, my staff, myself, the same way in, in California and, and all the other states. So yeah, it's been a long process and again significance, it's, it's, it's hard to uh, overstate this, people don't realize do they how important water is? Well I think the water is getting to be understood to be important. I think the basis of Arizona's economy in the last 15 years and certainly go forward in the future is, is largely dependent on the consistency and sustainability of supplies of water, both out of the Central Arizona project and out of the Salt River project. It's critical. People don't make long-term commitments to developing businesses or building homes or whatever it is if you don't have a sense that there's going to be a sustainable supply of the things that make quality of life and water is one of those indispensable commodities and I think it's a critical to the state of Arizona. A researcher at the University of Arizona has recently helped to discover some bizarre and perhaps unique information about the reproductive lives of insects known as diving beetles. Mark McLemore has an interview. Joining me to talk about this new discovery is one of the researchers involved in making it. We have Don Higginson with us, and we also have some friends in a tank of water here, two different species of diving beetles. Tell us who we have on the table. Um, we have two um, species that can be found locally, Thermonectus marmoratus, and those ones have the yellow dots. And the other one is a related species, Thermonectus nigrofasciatus, and they have a black band on their back. And are these the same types of diving beetles that your research has centered upon? These are related um, beetles, but I was working in central New York at the time, so most of the species that I used were collected locally there. Well, what is it about diving beetles that made them an interesting subject for this kind of research? Diving beetles have been studied for a long time, and in fact, back in 1895, Emil Balowitz described the sperm of a few species of diving beetles, and he had noticed that some sperm form pairs, where two sperm heads join, two sperm join at the head, um, and then swim together as a unit and are transferred to the female this way. And we were very interested um, in understanding why the sperm might form pairs and how that evolved. And does this increase the viability of the sperm and, and the chances for reproduction? Uh, what's the advantage of this adaption? Well, those are still outstanding questions in this field. The main hypothesis is that. Um, Conjugation, which is what we call when the two sperm join together, increases sperm motility, um, and that can be an advantage in reaching the site of fertilization, um, either first or maintaining their position there, which is one of the discoveries in our recent paper. Well, let's learn a little bit more about diving beetle reproduction. What would constitute a romantic evening for these guys? Well, I'm afraid the evenings wouldn't be so romantic. Um, in many species of diving beetles, the females appear to have very little control over the males who they mate with. 
and a male will literally jump on the back of a female as she swims by, or another male to try it out. They, they try first, ask questions later. Okay. And males have large suckers on their feet that they use to grasp onto the female. They're like suction cups. And they stick them onto the back of the females, and the females can try and dislodge the males. Um, they may or may not do that. But in this case, males control females' access to air. They need to go to the water surface to breathe, and if a female doesn't mate, doesn't consent to mating, she doesn't get to breathe. So the suckers that are on the end of the male's legs, that's an adaption that's exclusively for reproductive purposes? Yes. Okay. So how do you go about studying the sperm of the diving beetles in a laboratory environment? Well, one of the great things about diving beetles is that they're very abundant in their natural habitat, and they can be found in virtually any freshwater worldwide, from the largest lake to the smallest puddle. And so what I do is I go out in the field and I collect diving beetles, bring them back into the lab, identify them to species, and then under a microscope, um, after euthanasia, I dissect them and I can harvest the sperm from the males or from the females. Um, is this adaption unique to diving beetles or how widespread has the changes in the male sperm been detected in the animal world? So scientists have described the sperm of thousands of species, and from that sort of massive research effort, we know that sperm morphology is incredibly diverse. Um, sperm is, we have this interesting adaptation of sperm conjugation in diving beetles, and that occurs in a few other species. Um, of insects? Of insects, but also of mammals. Um, so some rodents form conjugates as do some opossums, which are marsupials, of course. Is there any particular reason why you think this adaption occurred in diving beetles? What would have been the original uh, stimulus for that? Well, this is something that we're still investigating. So females, female diving beetles have sort of unusual reproductive tracts in that they are like a conduit. So there's one way in and a second way out. Whereas um, in most species, Females have a sperm storage organ that's like a cul-de-sac. Sperm enter and exit through the same duct. So we think that perhaps conjugation provides an advantage about maintaining the sperm's position um, in the exit duct where the sperm are used for fertilization. Well, once a female is fertilized, then what's the reproductive process for her that will follow? Well, this is one of the things about these diving beetles. Though they're incredibly abundant, um, and lots of people have worked on describing species. We know very little about their reproductive habitat or about their reproductive behavior. We do know, for example, um, with Thermonectus marmoratus, females will lay eggs near the water surface or just outside of the water surface, and those eggs hatch in a few days, and the larvae will develop two adults in a couple of weeks. What's the major food source for these animals? All diving beetles are predaceous, and they'll eat just about anything they can manage to catch. Including each other. Including each other. Well, can you sum up in a, in a short way how you got involved in this line of research? Well, um, I had become interested in unusual sperm, sperm adaptations. I'd been working previously on a moth, and I learned in the process of my research that all moths and butterflies produce two distinct types of sperm, one with DNA, one without DNA. And the sperm without DNA can be produced in massive quantities. It can be over 90% of an ejaculate. And I was really interested in that question. But moths proved to be a very difficult system to work on because it, you can't really manipulate the proportions of, of the sperm with DNA and the sperm without DNA. Mm -hmm. And then I found out about conjugation in these diving beetles and got a little distracted and ended up working on them full time. Well, thanks for coming and sharing a little bit about your research. The paper was recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. So congratulations on your publication. Thank you.
When a new film adaptation of a literary work arrives in local theaters, it can often spur a new generation of readers to seek out the original book. This is expected to happen again with the long-awaited film version of The Hobbit. And the Pima County Library is preparing with special parties. Mark McLemore and his guests tell us more. And joining us now directly from Middle Earth and the Valencia branch of the Pima County Public Library, we have Tanya Mayorga, who works as a library associate there, Melissa Porta, who is uh, now a library page, and also joining us is Mary Givens the Gray from the Council of Wizards to preside over this conversation. So Tanya, please tell us, how did the library first decide to do Hobbit parties? Well, in the past, we've had a lot of success with other parties based on books such as the Harry Potter series, The Hunger Games, and there's also a great party um, based on manga. And um, we had great attendance and there was a lot of enthusiasm. So um, Mary and the other teens librarian decided that with the upcoming uh, release of the new Hobbit movie, that this would be a good opportunity to, to tap into that, um, that energy and, and create fun for um, all ages. Well, what can people expect when they attend one of these parties? Well, they can definitely expect to see hobbits <laughs> and a wizard, and we'll have games and crafts and um, definitely food. Well, we can't see all of the details of your hobbit costumes on the set right now, but you do have hobbit feet. Yes. And I see that you brought an example also of the ones that you make as part of the uh, crafts uh, part of this. Yes. Um, Definitely, um, the, cra the Hobbit feet are one of my favorite crafts. Um, there's also these dolls that um, Mary and some other volunteers have been sewing so um, kids can decorate into their favorite um, Hobbit characters, either as um, Frodo, Bilbo, uh, Gandalf, or, or their favorite dwarf. Uh -huh. And Melissa, tell us about your uh, involvement in this. Uh, what is it about the parties that appeals to you? You know, it's just... Um, I get to be able to dress up um, as a hobbit and, and see in, um, kids how like they enjoy making um, their favorite characters of the book and, and um, being able to enjoy um, what I enjoyed as a kid when I read The Hobbit. Well, are you excited about this film release now? Oh, I am. I'm very excited. Um, does this give you an opportunity to kind of find out what the Tucson fan community is like? Are you surprised when people come out, say, dress as their favorite characters or to show their support for the book? I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm very much expecting it. Cause that's what I'm going to be dressing up as, and I'm very excited to be able to be a part of it. And the, the elements of your costume, you've got the dress and the ears, mm -hmm. which are lovely. So how did you go about putting this together? Um, well, we tried to match what girl hobbits female hobbits look like in, in the movie. So we have like the little headbands with the flowers and the ears. And um, wow, this is actually part of the, one of the crafts that we'll be making. It's a dragon's eye. And um, of course, the hobbit feet. <laughs> well, Tanya, do you think that maybe young people are surprised that events like this happen at the library? I think sometimes they are. If, um, if they're not used to coming to the public library, um, I think that they don't know that it can be a fun place. Um, one of the good things about um, offering these parties is that when we invite people of all ages, we have um, services for, for people and they get to learn more about um, those because not only do we do fun things like this, but we also offer um, GED classes, citizenship, um, homework help. And, um, and then we also have craft clubs after school, and um, Mary runs a, a great um, teen program, and they're really incorporating a lot of technology. Um, so it's a, it's a good way to bring families in, and, and then they get to learn more about library services. Well, I know that you have several of these events planned for the upcoming week, so why don't you give us a little bit of a schedule of how our viewers can participate? Okay. Well, um, the next one will take place on Friday, December 7th at the Flowing Wells Library, and that will take place after hours at the library, so it's a good opportunity for um, everybody to get loud in the library and have fun. Um, after that, there will be uh, four parties on Saturday, December 8th at different libraries, different times, and then three parties on Wednesday, December 12th, and the last one will be on Friday, December 14th at the Wilmot Library. Well, although you expected to be here, thank you for taking the journey from Middle Earth to share this story with us and have fun at the library. Thank, thank you. you. Now we are joined by Christopher Conover and this week's edition of Political Focus. 
Governor Jan Brewer left Arizona on what was called official business on Sunday. The problem is nobody knows where she is. Reporters have asked her staff about the governor's whereabouts, but got no answers. But even the best kept secrets in government are subject to leaks. Reports are now surfacing that the governor is in Afghanistan visiting Arizona National Guard troops. And in this case, secrecy may equal security. However, these are unconfirmed reports. Arizona Public Media contacted the governor's office for confirmation on the governor's location. The state is not without leadership while Brewer is wherever she is. Constitutionally, Secretary of State Ken Bennett is acting governor until the governor returns. Brewer's office says she'll be back in the state over the weekend. And that's this week's Political Focus. The 4th Avenue Winter Street Fair in Tucson is being held this weekend and tens of thousands of people are expected to attend this very popular event. In tonight's video postcard from photographer and editor Santiago Bati, we bring you some of the sights and sounds from this stimulating gathering in 2011. <laughs> You can get more news and information on our website, azpm.org. To comment on any story you saw tonight, click on it online and go to the bottom. We can also be reached via Facebook and Twitter. Coming up tomorrow night, we'll tell you about a TED event that is being held in Tucson. TED stands for Technology, Entertainment and Design. Also, the Southern Arizona Women's Chorus is getting ready for its holiday concerts. And student filmmakers will be showcasing their productions. I'm Tony Paniagua. From all of us at Arizona Public Media, have a great night.